Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking today about some of the mainstays of uh, business life in any community, including here in southern New England. Later in the show, we're going to talk to a senior executive from Rockland Trust, the fast-growing banking group out of Massachusetts. It's also got a sizable footprint here in Rhode Island. But first, very glad to be joined by two lawyers who uh, may be familiar faces to some of you out there. I'm joined by William Devereaux and William O'Gara. They are both principals and co-founders co -founders at Pannon Lopes, Devra, West, and West, the law firm. Thanks, guys, for being here. Great, thank you. Thank so you we're time. here for a celebration. Maybe we should have cake because your firm is hitting its tenth anniversary. You were founded in uh, 2006. Bill Devro, I'm going to I'm going to start with you on this. Um, what made you and the other partners, the other founders, decide in 2006? You know, we're going to put out our own shingle, start our own firm. Well, it, it started when we were members of a very large national firm, and that firm decided they wanted to consolidate a bit so they wanted us to move to boston and that was not something we're rhode island lawyers <laughs> not something that we thought was uh, in our best interest so uh, there was a group of us that basically decided we were just going to go off on our own and uh, start a new firm and i think the main ingredient that we had when when we started was we had a, a very good collegial mix uh, and that, that was very important because if we were going to make this plunge we wanted to go in with people that we were comfortable with and trusted. What you, uh, what you might not have had was perfect timing. Now, well, it's worked out, so maybe I shouldn't that. say that. But, boy, 2006, what a time to start any venture. I mean, the housing crash was picking up speed in Rhode Island. Great Recession was coming nationally and locally. I mean, did, was it, did you white-knuckle it a bit, the early years there? Well, it was, a, it was questionable at first, but fortunately, we have deep roots to the state. We have varied practice areas, and we've been able to develop the client base that we have that supported us and grown with us over the years. What did you have to do during that period? Was it any different than if you'd, if you'd started the firm in healthier times? Did you have it, to make any different strategic moves well, or you, You're growing slowly. You're obviously watching where you're ex spending dollars, but most importantly, you're focused on the clients and you're providing them with cost-effective results and that in turn generates goodwill and you and you go from there it's like any other business so i uh you now have 40 lawyers in nine offices uh new england new york and florida and i, I think i know part of the answer but i'm going to ask you actually why why did you add florida to your geographic mix well we invested in a very uh a good uh, estate probate practice and that's headed up by uh, bernie jack voney who some remember is the lieutenant governor of the state of Rhode Island, but he's also got a very strong expertise uh, in the probate estate area. Uh, and we've since actually added on to that roster. But uh, a lot of Rhode Islanders moved to Florida. Yeah. And so to keep the continuity with the clients and to grow the business locally in Florida, we made that investment. And it's turned out to be a do you, I all, think a profitable do you all fight over who gets to visit the Florida office in the summertime? Go to <laughs> Not in the summertime. The winter, yeah, in the wintertime. Yeah. 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 Summer, it's here, Rhode Island. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Bill Garrett, it's, it, everyone knows, we've even talked about it on the show before, the legal industry's gone through a lot of flux uh, since the recession. It seems like the, the whole model is changing for, for law firms, for lawyers, billable hours, all that kind of stuff. Um, what have been the biggest changes as, as you and you guys, all of you at your firm have seen it, and, and how have you adjusted to that? I, I think one of the changes has been there's a focus on value. The clients are, are no longer accepting sky-high hourly rates, sort of bills that don't make sense. They're looking for good value. They're looking for results. They're looking for lawyers to do work efficiently and to staff cases appropriately. And that's something that I think we've done a good job working with their associates and other partners to get the work done in an efficient manner so you have a good result for the client and the relationship continues and grows. Bill Devereaux, how about you? You know, you've been you've been at this for a while now in the, in the legal world. What what have you noticed? What stands out to you about the changes happening in the profession right now? I, th I think Bill captured most of it, but uh, clients want to know going in 
as best as you can estimate for them how much a certain type of representation is going to cost. Now you can't, in litigation, which is what I do and Bill does a fair amount of it, you can't guarantee that generally because you don't know sometimes how litigation sure. is going to develop and something that might be simple all of a sudden gets complicated or something that's complicated, uh, hopefully you can make it simple and save the client some money. But those are things you got to talk with the clients uh, almost universally up front about and how you're going to staff the case, who's going to work on it. Some clients are looking for uh, other types of models for compensation, whether it's a reduced hourly rate with a uh, success fee at the end, uh, which you could do in some civil litigation matters. You can't do that in criminal cases, but um, they're looking for imaginative ways to work with the firm, and Bill is absolutely right. Uh, even at the high corporate level, a lot of these uh, in-house counsel will tell firms up front, you know, if you become a, run a runaway train on the billing, you're not going to last very long. Which is just a, a sea change kind of in how people look at at the yeah. at the market, yeah. No, I think law firms, especially in the bigger cities, are so used to <laughs> billing these uh, $750 an hour, $1,000 an hour, and, and there's pushback now. Uh, and some corporations are looking elsewhere. And it's lasted past the end of the recession. You know, the economy is yeah. clearly healthier, but the, the change in the mindset on the other side of these uh, cases has, has changed. I think for the yeah, most part they're it much, has. The clients are much more sensitive about the results and, and the cost. And that's, that's critical. What are the expectations? What is it that we're trying to achieve? How do we get from point A to point B? All right, we're going to talk more about the changing world of the law after we take a break here on Executive Suite. We're talking with William Devereaux and William O'Gara. They are principals at Pannone, Lopes, Devereaux and West. And also later on in the show, we're going to hear from a senior executive at Rockland Trust, the uh, growing bank. So stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking today about the law and finance. Later on, we're going to hear from a senior banker at Rockland Trust, talk about the financial world. But right now, very pleased to be joined by William Devereaux and William O'Gara. They are principals and co-founders at Pannone Lopes Devereaux and West, the law firm, prominent law firm here in Rhode Island, that actually celebrating its 10th anniversary in 2016 here, which we're talking about. So uh, lawyers, kind of like reporters, uh, get to get to learn about a lot of different topics if you have an interest practice and everything. You get to go into all different things. Uh, it might be more remunerative at times to be on your side of the table, but I'm curious about the, the big issues that are coming up in cases, what you're getting, cases about clients talking about. Uh, Bill Garrow, I'll start with you on that. What are you seeing uh, in your case mix that's interesting? My practice area is predominantly in the employment area, and, and in the last 10 years since this firm's been in existence, there's really been a sea change in that and the employees are much more sophisticated as to what their rights are, what they believe they're entitled to. Uh, they're much more willing to be litigious. They're much more willing to go forward with, with claims. There's a, there's a small army of lawyers out there to serve them on the employee side. And for the employers, it's a environment where decisions that they make regarding employment will uh, routinely subject to challenge. So it, it's an environment where the employers need to get more sophisticated because their employees have gotten more sophisticated. And there's been a continual increase in the numbers and types of employment cases that you see in the state. And really the recession almost drove that because people would lose jobs and it would mm -hmm. not be easy to replace that job. And then they're more likely to challenge the decision to terminate their employment. So on the employment side, there's, there's just more litigation, more claims, and the employers have had to up their game, so to speak, as to how they deal with people. Now, is that a way that the law, the case law, and the, the culture has developed in Rhode Island specifically, or are you seeing that nationally? Uh, it isn't. No, that's a, it's, it's definitely a northeast trend. You see the same thing in Massachusetts, but 
but you know, people are just more sophisticated as to, well, why did you terminate me? Mm -hmm. Or is it because, you know, I'm a, a pregnant woman? Is it because I'm a person of color? There's, there's just a, a recognition of potential claims out there and a willingness to pursue claims that 10 years ago, I think employees from Wally could go, okay, I lost the job, I gotta go find the next job. Interesting, more litigious culture maybe in some ways. Uh, Bill Devereaux, how about you? You've been involved some, in some fascinating cases over the years. What's, what's been coming up over the last 10 years uh, on your caseload? It's certainly been varied and interesting. Uh, as a litigator, you're sort of uh, performing the legal version of emergency medicine. Usually when it gets to us, something has gone wrong. Yeah. Uh, I've, you might say either blessed or cursed with having some rather unusual cases over the years, both, both in the criminal arena and in the civil arena. On the civil side, I think we're seeing an increase in the intellectual property litigation, uh, and, and that's probably going to increase uh, their own That's who owns logos, content, all that kind of stuff. Trademarks, yeah. all, all of those things. Uh, and we've grown in, in that particular area. We also, um, uh, I think, see a lot more in the healthcare area that boils over into um, sometimes courtroom litigation, but oftentimes it's administrative litigation. Uh, we were involved in a case where one hospital had a uh, uh, stem cell uh, project, and we, <clears throat> because of the Rhode Island's Health Services Council, we actually w were litigating mm -hmm. over that, and and uh, it was a fairly drawn out and, and uh, important piece of litigation. So uh, in the in the criminal arena, I do a lot of white collar work, and sometimes in Rhode Island, you you, you get a lot of work in that area. There are opportunities <laughs> in Rhode Island. You said it, not me. <laughs> but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, changes in, in the law, I would say um, uh, you know, we have to keep abreast very carefully of changes from uh, in, in, in the Supreme Court's uh, rulings on the Constitution, mm. search and seizure issues and those types of things, uh, and how they may affect corporations because there's an awful lot of um, you know, when a subpoena goes out to a corporation, now you go, you, you've got to analyze it. Uh, you almost have to ha you have to have an IT specialist sure. sitting next to you, yeah. and you got to determine what's privileged, what's not privileged, and you got to put a privilege lock together. And uh, when I first started the practice, weren't doing that. that, that <laughs> you know, you were right. You were writing out your briefs. I guess I'm getting that old, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, then you went from the to the tape recorder, and yeah. now. Uh, your secretaries expect you to type up half the brief before <laughs> it gets to them. And you're still with the stone tablet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He's, yeah. Got, he's coming down from the mountain. So there's been, in, in, in the technological world, there's been a, a, a rapid change. I only have about uh, a minute left, but I, I want to get you both quickly to weigh in on this. I, look, I'm 32. I have a lot of friends who've gone or are considering going to law school. I also know a lot of lawyers say, be careful, there's a lot of lawyers out there. What advice are you giving people today when they come to you say, I want to be a lawyer? Uh, my view of it is it, at this point in time, it has to be something that you really want to do. You have to have the fire in, the, in your belly to do it because if not, it can be a, ver a very difficult practice in, in the current environment that we're in to make a living. It's not what it was. 20 years ago, it's not what it was 30 years ago. You have to really want it if you're going to go to law school. Bill Devereaux, your thoughts on that? I, I think there's definitely a glut in, in the market, uh, certainly in the Northeast. Uh, I, I believe, as Bill does, if somebody has a, a burning desire to be a lawyer, and that's what I tell young people that come to see me, make sure this is what you want to invest in. Now, there are a lot of things you can do with a law degree. It doesn't mean you have to uh, go off and, you know, it's not L.A. law. Uh, it, you can do a number of different things with the law degree. But if you're going to put that three years in, if you're going full-time or four, if you're going nights, you you got to be prepared and have a, uh, your, your eyes wide open in terms of what the marketplace is uh, because it's a one expensive investment. All right, that's some good advice from some people who know, so if you think of becoming a lawyer out there, take it to heart. William Devereux, William O'Gara from Pannon, Lopes, Devereux and West, thank you both so much thank for you. joining thank me. You, Stick too. with us if you're watching though, because coming up next, we're gonna talk to a senior executive from Rockland Trust about what's going on in the investment world. Stick with us on Executive Suite.
Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and very happy to be joined now by Larry Wagner. He is a vice president at Rockland Trust, specializes in the investment world. A lot of people figuring out how and if they'll be able to retire. Larry, thanks for joining me. Nice to meet you, Ted. So, uh, for banking the lawyers, very often go hand in hand. So Absolutely, it all goes together. work a lot together. <laughs> so, first, um, Rockland Trust. When I said you were coming on, a couple people said to me, I "said I've noticed. I feel like I see more of their branches around. Maybe they're expanding. Can you talk a little about the banks, the bank's growth, and and how?" How big it is today? Sure, we're glad to hear that. Um, Rockland Trust is an eight billion dollar institution, largest commercial bank headquartered in eastern Massachusetts. We're out of uh, Hanover, Mass, the executive offices. Uh, publicly traded under the ticker symbol INDB. Wealth Management Group, where I hang my hat, it manages about three billion dollars asset based um, investment management for individuals, institutions, and, and corporations. Uh, growth has been fantastic. We've loved coming to Southeastern Mass in Rhode Island. We've been here since 2008. Wonderful timing. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to sure. say, scary to white knuckling yeah. it for everybody around then in, in the banking world. Um, how about uh, rounds? I remember when, when you opened in Boston. It was a big deal for Rockland Trust More to get recently, into the, sure. the regional hub. But um, how about Rhode Island and Southeastern Massachusetts? How do they fit into the bank's sort of plans for growth and expansion in the coming years? Yeah, glad you asked. Uh, very nicely. Frankly, uh, we have no retail branches in Rhode Island. Uh, I live in Rhode Island. We have uh, about a hundred Rockland Trust employees in Southeastern Mass in Rhode Island. When I say Southeastern Mass, I mean sort of the Fairhaven, New Bedford area where we do have branches across to Seekonk and up through Attleboro. Uh, we do have a wealth management and commercial lending office in the IGT building, former GTEC building, which we where we opened about five years ago, I believe. Uh, it's been the, the second largest commercial lending production office and it has the lead commercial lender uh, volume wise in Rockland Trust. Uh, Rockland has over a thousand employees and uh, dozens and dozens of commercial <laughs> lenders so we think that's uh, something to be proud of. Business and has been good. And if people uh, go to Cape Cod this summer they might see you, right? Absolutely. Uh, good, uh, good distribution on the, on the Cape. We just recently closed on our latest acquisition uh, bank of Cape Cod. It was a four branch bank. Uh, again, publicly traded. Uh, we expect that to be accretive to earnings. One of Rockland Trust's um, beliefs when we do make an acquisition of another bank is that we want it to be accretive to earnings uh, from the get go. Yeah, <laughs> which so. uh, some banks have not done that to their uh, unhappiness as they look ahead. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, the, the <laughs> banks didn't necessarily go that way. <laughs> How about the uh, the big bank versus small bank thing? Sure. You know, when you guys look around at the competitive landscape, yeah. are you are you looking primarily up, say, not to say up like they're Understood. better, but just largeness? You up to Bank of American Citizens? You're looking at the the smaller we have Bank of Rhode Island ones like that around sure. here, or is it all of them? Actually, actually, it's all of them. Uh, we like to consider ourselves a, a big little bank and, and sort of a, a little big bank. Uh, what I mean by that is we're really relationship people. Although we have the products and services and technology necessary to, to take a sizable account, uh, we have a legal lending limit of $100 million to one client. Not that we would get there, uh, but we certainly have. Uh, I'm planning 50, my wedding. I might there, need that. Well, yeah. there you go. As long as you pay us back, we can You're talk. All right, that's, all right. the, that's the key to our credit policy. Um, so actually, we're we're shopping in both of those markets and doing quite nicely in both. So uh, we're taping middle of 2016. Uh, sure. One of the things I always love to ask bankers because you talk to a lot of people, you have clients, you have your fellow uh, bankers. What's your sense of how the economy is doing in our region? What are you hearing? What's the what's the vibe you get? Uh, best information we can give you is uh, really from our clients. Uh, our clients have are good business people all based in this area. We are really a regional and local regional bank, really from Boston through Rhode Island. We don't do much outside of this area. We do not solicit any business outside of this area. Um, and our, our businesses that we've picked up recently, um, good businesses, sometimes in tough industries, uh, but they're good operators. They know how to run a business. They expect us to stand with them when times get tough and, and uh, we've done that and it pays dividends uh, because when they get healthy again, sure. uh, when they talk to their friends and people that they do work with, uh, we get we get phone calls. Still important relationships very much in the in the banking world. Yeah. It's our competitive advantage. Yeah, uh, you know, we, we, we can't spend a billion dollars on technology. We have to spend enough to provide the 
the products and services that people need. For instance, I live in Rhode Island without any branches. I can go to any ATM machine at any bank in the, in the area and access money without uh, paying a fee. It's good. Your boss wouldn't be happy to find out you had a different bank uh, as your debit card. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're an investment pro. You help Absolutely. people with retirement and everything. Sure. I wanted to ask you, what's the biggest mistake you see people making? Or, you know, when you're telling friends and family, don't do, be careful here, you got to sure. do this. What do you say? Sure. Uh, there are several, and it sort, of, it sort of depends on the person. But if I had to, had to make a general comment, quite frankly, it's people don't live within their means. Mm. Um, and it's not, I'm not saying it's before easy. Before they retire? Before they retire. And it's really difficult to start when you're 59, when you're 50, and have a retirement nest egg that's going to meet the needs in your lifestyle that you've grown accustomed to. Uh, I started when I was early 20s when I filled out a, my first employment paperwork and the manager of the company said, you didn't do it correctly because I hadn't signed up for the 401k. <laughs> Those were the days when the manager could force you to do it. <laughs> I was in manufacturing at that time, and that's when I sort of found my love for the investment business. So you need to start early, and you need to save consistently. So in some ways, even even as an investment pro, you'd acknowledge you just you need capital. You've got to save money. You're not gonna you're not gonna hit some golden egg and, and have that bail you out for retirement. Uh, uh, very few. <laughs> and what we found, quite frankly, people that easy come, easy go. Uh, mm. I think there've been some studies done that we've seen. Uh, lottery winners and people that fall into windfalls don't keep it very often. Yeah, they, we run they those really stories don't. on the news, unfortunately. You see it? Yeah. yeah. So you started out in '87 uh, in banking, uh, oh, sure. nearly three decades ago. Old Stone Bank. People might remember that here in Some Rhode Island. Some people remember yeah. it. Sure. Um, what would you say have been the biggest changes in banking in your uh, nearly three decades now in the in the industry? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, to be honest with you, things are faster. Mm. Everybody has access to almost the same information that we professionals do almost in the same amount of time if they want it. Um, that's a good and a bad. If you really have a passion for investing and you love to do it and you're intellectually capable, um, you can manage your own money. What we found is our most successful clients certainly are bright people. Um, they have the ability to do it. They don't necessarily have the temperament and they really don't have the time. It's not something you can go home, sit on the computer at 15 minutes for, at night on your way home and watch the news and say, here's what I'm going to do and be successful. So still watch the news, but don't invest based on it, right? Well, you <laughs> have to do more than news. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It takes more than 15 exactly. minutes. Exactly. All right, Larry Wagner, Rockland Trust Vice President. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, you get some, get, they have more investment advice and retirement advice on their website. And I hope you tell people to check that out. Um, if you missed the first half of the show, we had on two lawyers from Pannon, Lopes, Devro, and West. And you can catch the whole episode, like all episodes, online on WPRI.com. We also are now on a, iTunes as a podcast. So you can download us uh, every week, the new episode. So you can get that. You can get newsmakers as well. Uh, we'll see you back here next week on Executive Suite. Great. Thank you.